American Ed Radio, leading the education discussion. And now, your host, Jack Ford. Welcome back to American Ed Radio on WVOX. So, if you are the parent of a high school senior right now, you're probably either in the midst of serious angst as you're waiting to get that envelope in the mail, or perhaps nowadays it's all done electronically. Um, but if you're the parent of a, of a junior or a sophomore or a freshman, even an eighth grader, uh, you're probably starting to say to yourself, okay, when should I start to work on this whole notion of where they're going to college or what university should they go to? Well, our next guest is going to help you answer that question. Rob Fran, a good friend of ours, is the senior vice president and publisher for the Princeton Review. You know the Princeton Review. We walk into a Barnes & Noble, and they are there in an entire section. They tell you everything you need to know about getting into colleges, where you should be looking, and, and Rob's the guy to come to. It. Rob, let me start off with this. Is it ever too early? To, for you as a parent to start looking at this whole notion of my child, are they going to go to college? Where are they going to go? How do I get them in? How do I pay for it? The short answer, Jack, is that it is never, ever too early to start introducing the idea of the college process into our discussion, whether you're the parents of an eighth grader, as you were saying before, or parents of a junior or senior in high school right, right now. The way that you can diffuse the frenzy and making bad choices around college is to start to talk about it as early as possible. Yeah. I, I mean, I go back to, you know, when I was, I go back to when, when, when I'm in high school, you know, you took the SAT once. There right. were no <laughs> prep courses. Uh, I mean, when you started looking at schools, I was fortunately being recruited to play football, but even the recruiting process didn't start to late in your junior year and into the fall of your senior year now it seems that that everybody is getting trying to get a head start on this whole process so let's let's talk about getting that head start sure how do you first decide to focus on what category of schools your child should be looking at it's it's a good question and i think it's a question on lots of folks minds it, we address it from the prince review perspective is helping a student and a family find the right fit in school and that fit we define as a trifecta first part has got to be an academic fit you want to make sure that you as a student are challenged in the classroom that your professors are good teachers that they encourage class discussion that's the place that you want to go to school because you're challenged academically two has to be a great campus culture fit. When we start to think about Vassar and Brigham Young, Young, two awesome schools, but two very different schools, likely two very different I've, I've been to parties at Vassar. I have not been to parties at Brigham Young, um, but they, uh, very different cultures, as absolutely, you say. Absolutely, absolutely. And the third part is a financial aid fit. You want to make sure that you're not mortgaging out your future as a student to pay for school, same thing with family. So it has to be that fit of those three different things. Oftentimes you, you hear either parents or even the students saying, this is the one I have to get into this school. This is my only school, the yeah. only place I want to go to. Uh, I, I don't know what will happen to me if I don't get in. Is it a good idea to focus that precisely on a single? Is there just one right school for you? I, I don't think that there's just one right school. And I've been writing about schools for a long time at the Princeton Review. I visit actively 50 to 60 undergrad schools a, a, a year. But the truth is that there's 3,500 four-year colleges in the U.S. alone. So the likelihood that only one school is going to be right for you, it's just statistically unreasonable. But so, so the thing is, and what we want to do with Prince Review, is make sure that we're, we're crossing or giving you a great cross-section of schools so that you can choose without question that that one school is the one for you, or to say, you know what, there's another five schools that I didn't even know about just last year that might actually be really good fits for me. Let's talk about resources. Yeah. And obviously, the Princeton Review is, is, and I don't say this just because you're sitting here, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I had uh, two children through college, one through medical re re school. I, I lived on the Princeton Review right. for many years. So uh, what are the resources? Where do you start going and what do you start looking for as that first step, which is let's, let's create a package of schools that we should start looking at? How do you do that? I think the easiest way to do it is to certainly honor the things that you've been thinking about for a long time. I was giving a talk at uh, Brooklyn Tech uh, la la last week. Thousand folks showed up, parents and students, and we did this one exercise with them. I think you'll enjoy this. So we asked students to write down the names of three schools that they would love to see themselves at as college freshmen. But it doesn't matter about academic admission. Doesn't matter about um, uh, doesn't matter about uh, ad admissions or financial aid. We asked the same thing for parents, and then I said, okay, cross off the following schools. Cross off every Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. Cross off uh, you know another handful of schools. We named off twenty schools, and then we asked for a showing of hands. Who still has three schools left on your list? Jack, crickets in the audience. <laughs> Two schools, one school. The idea of challenging the perception, as you're saying, mm -hmm. is the way to do it. Honor those schools that you thought about, but start extending the list. The easiest way to do it, start thinking about student opinion. There's a ton of access to current student opinion, academic or otherwise, 
that's the information that you need to focus on to start crafting that good list. Let me see, I'm bringing some of our yeah. callers here. Matt from Columbus, Ohio is with us and, and has a question. Matt, how are you? Good. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I have got three daughters. Uh, my oldest is uh, in the middle of her freshman year, and then I've got a sixth grader and a fifth grader. My question is, is it too early to start the discussion? And, you know, with, with, uh, with three daughters, uh, I, I can only imagine it's a good idea for, for uh, the younger girls to, to start to get into the dialogue as well. So, so when's the right time, and, and, and can you have the discussion too early? All right, thanks, Matt. Rob, when's the right time? And yeah, can you have the discussion too early? Absolutely the right question. It is never too early to start thinking about college, but to talk about it substantively, to talk about, hey, how do you like to learn in the classroom right now, whether you're a sixth grader or you're already an early high school freshman or sophomore? Do you like having class discussions? Do you like having um, you know, your teacher lead discussions? Do you like to have access to that faculty member outside the classroom? Those are the things that you can start to think about saying, I like this as a student right now. I can see myself liking those things in college and then start pairing those things with what, we're, what we know is the academic experience at a school, either a school that's 32,000 kids or 2,000 kids. That's going to determine some of that classroom experience. Same thing on the outside of the classroom experience. Got another caller with us, Vince from New Rochelle. Vince, welcome. What's your question for Rob? Hi, how you doing? Uh, just a question maybe you can help me with a little confusion. I have uh, two kids who are undocumented, and I wanted to know whether there are government loans available and uh, taxpayer-supported loans that I can use to help my kids go to school. Well, you know, it's an excellent question. When we start to think about and and the dialogue is changing as we have this conversation around documented and undocumented uh, students. Here's the easiest thing to remember if you're a high school student. You need to do well in high school. When we start to think about the metrics to actually to have some curb appeal when it comes to the admissions process, we're looking at two things. How well a kid did in high school, how well a student did on the SAT and ACT. Those are the two biggest levers that are going to be pulled to say that you're qualified for admission, but then sort of your point qualified for financial aid, both academic academic aid, based on right. their prowess a- academically, and then sort of that documentation status will help determine that need-based aid applying through the government, the FAFSA form, that free application for federal student aid. Right. Well, what, what is the rule, though? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, getting, a, I'm not getting an understanding. Uh, if, I, if I wanted to apply for you know, that FAFSA stuff and all of that that I'm hearing about, uh, the fact that my kids are unfortunately undocumented, uh, does the government say they, they can't get the government loans? Well, right now, students would have to be documented to, to qualify for the, for, for the FAFSA, for, 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 those student, for those federal loans. When we start right. to think about it again, still focusing on that academic prowess in the classroom can qualify those students for academic scholarships outside of right. financial aid. Right. Right. So, right. So and it's, you know, let me jump in for one second, Vince, because I, I know that the answer to your question is that there are various answers. And, and no, each of the states are trying to deal with the, the issue right now. And it's become, as you mentioned, it's become a, 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 uh, an issue that's I sort of in the forefront. I so. might know the answer to that. that that's that's yeah. unfortunate. All right, thank you. All right, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Uh, we've got another caller coming in, Susan from Oklahoma. Susan, how are you? And what is your question? Uh, yes, hi. I am... Um my son and I are looking at colleges, and we're looking at the price per year for, year for different schools. And as we all know, they're very, very expensive and increasingly so year after year. And we're trying to decide, you know, if a good factor for deciding which school he should go to and where he should apply should be based on um, – what the income level is of students graduating in in the major that he wants to graduate in, what the income level is, are they able to get jobs right away? Is there a source or a resource that we can go to to see what are these students making when they graduate and, and, and determining on, you know, which college you should go to based on that? This is an excellent question. I, I have two suggestions for you. One, we do a ranking list at the Princeton Review called Best Career Services. And I know that when, when Jack and I have been talking in the, in the past, we were saying, you know what, the admissions process 10 years ago, you didn't even talk about the career services aspect of, a, a, of an undergraduate education. It was often some silo that you wouldn't visit until your, your senior year. But right now, career services centers are either in the same building as your admissions office uh, you know, or, or very close to, the, close to that. Rob, let me uh, ask you a question because it ties in sort yeah. of to what we've we've heard before, and that is, if you're from a, a family of limited means, yep. again, I go back to I was raised by a single parent. My mom raised four kids, so you know if I was going to go to college, somebody's going to have to be paying for it. If, if is do you automatically cross off 
high schools that you would look at, certain Ivy League schools or certain other ones that are well regarded but happen to be expensive? Or is there a way that they can indeed still be affordable for it, you? This is an excellent question. And one of the worst mistakes we've seen students make is to cross off that expensive school just based on sticker price alone. I'll give you a couple of examples why that is incorrect. Many schools that have high sticker prices give out a great deal of aid when we start to think about merit-based aid based on academic merit and based on financial aid as well. We've been doing our best value colleges. I mean, when we start to think about it, there are so many schools out there that give out a ton of aid for students. Never make that mistake of crossing that school off your list. Um, we had one other caller coming in. Uh, Bob from Texas has a question for us. Bob, how are you? Fine, fine. I just wanted to check. I see a lot of colleges and universities advertised on television, and I wonder what type universities these are. Is there a way you can check the accreditation of a college that you're interested in for a child to see if they are oh, academically legitimate in the academic world, mm -hmm. if they have uh, credits, they're going to be transferred from, one, you know, from that university to another. Is there a way to check accreditation and the legitimacy of some of these institutions? So, absolutely, there is a way to check it. I mean, you can check it on any number of websites. Prince Review, we have over 2,000 schools listed on our website that, that are only those accredited schools, to your, to your point. Now, the thing is that, that many schools will market themselves differently. Some may choose to do print advertisements. Some might choose to do radio or television. I mean, all of those things are in the canon of uh, uh, resources that a school can pull on, you know, to advertise. But the truth is that you can look at accreditation. You can look at other metrics, SAT and ACT scores. Uh, did students graduate from the top uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent of their high school class? Those are the things that are going to be, oh, of course, high school GPA, I, AP scores. Anything and everything, when we start to think about the academic composite of a student from high school, you have access to certain principles is a good place to do it. Many other places you can, you can, you can access this stuff as well. Rob, let me ask you about yeah. this, and you touched base on this before, the, the fact that the schools are going to look at, a lot of things to look at, but they're certainly going to look at your grades in high school, yeah. and you're going to look at, at your scores, SAT, ACTs. Um, if, if you hear it oftentimes from parents saying, I have a student who works hard, who does wonderfully well inside the classroom, doesn't test very well at all. Are we starting to see some movement either away from those hard test scores or being a little bit more flexible in terms of those SAT, ACT scores for, for applicants? A absolutely. And there's been a movement over the last, you know, let's say five, seven, ten years of, of score optional schools. There's a little over 500 four-year colleges that will not oblige a student to submit an SAT score or an ACT score. Well, they will only base their decision based on the profile of the student, but the academic profile will be based 100% on a student's high school GPA. Now, the truth is that many of those schools still use the SAT and ACT to qualify that student from a, from a financial aid perspective. So just to make sure that we don't go into the process with blinders on, some academic admission, but certainly for some financial aid as well. Another question that, that people often have, and that is, if they have a, 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 a child, a student, who is comparing packages, financial yep. aid pra packages from different schools, is it okay to negotiate? I, I think that most admissions folks and, and uh, financial aid folks will say negotiate is not the right term. Okay. All right. <laughs> but what is very fair is to say, you know, listen, we've done our due diligence. My, my, you know, me as a student, I applied to eight schools. I got into seven. I have two there at the top of my list, one that I love and I know is my first choice school. But we as a family can't make the numbers work. That is an appeal. That's not a negotiation in my mind. And that's where a school will say, okay, I understand that. Maybe we can look at these things t together. But it's not the... A school gave me this, B school gave me this, yeah. Hey, Rob, as always, as always, it's a delight and a pleasure to talk with you. you I always learn more. Unfortunately, my kids are gone, <laughs> but everybody else around us always learns more when they have a chance to talk with You're you. Rob Frank, tight. it's the Princeton Review. Once again, everything you need to know. Get on the website, get the books. They'll help you get through this whole process. Rob, thanks for you. And also, uh, once again, our thanks for Peter Cunningham, Jennifer Bell Elwanger, who joined us a little bit earlier today and talked about some of those hot-button issues that the schools are facing, especially this notion of how do we grade the teachers who grade uh, our children. So this has been our premier edition of American Ed Radio. As I said, we are the folks that take a look. We're the storytellers in the education world. We talk about the important issues, the culture, the business of education. We had a chance to do it with you here today. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us and hope that you'll join us again in the future as we take a look at all of those important issues surrounding the question of education because education matters. Thanks for joining us. Take care. You've been listening to American Ed Radio, the leader in delivering entertaining, trusted, and empowering education information. Join us and further the discussion online at AmericanEdTV.com.